I would now like to discuss one of the best stories I've seen in, in modern cinema. Um, I'm talking about the movie Gladiator. It came out in 2000, starring Russell Crowe and Jacqueline Phoenix. You told me you saw it last night. Yeah, I hadn't watched it before, so I knew we were going to talk about it. So I thought. Yeah, that I, I, I was very surprised by that. I was yeah, very I surprised know. by that. I don't know how I avoided it. Um, yeah. Now and, then, now and then there's a movie of substantial cultural significance that you just miss, and that was one I missed. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you made up for it. Um, so, Gladiator, I think this movie is ingrained in the psyche of my generation more so than any other like epic epic movie of its of its sort so there's other characters there's there's aragorn from lord of the rings there's hector from troy there's william wallace from braveheart there's spartacus there's leonidas from 300 all these characters are the same archetypal figures but somehow only maximus decimus meridius really sticks really sticks through the years and i have uh, i've I've put some thought into this and I have some ideas about why particularly this character and this movie uh, sticks. I want to present to you three points that culminate in what I think is the implicit central thesis that runs throughout the movie. So I'm going to list now the three points and then the central thesis. Point number one is that Maximus is by far the best modern portrayal of the male archetype. Um, so he's highly capable, but very gentle, and he's modest in word and body language, and he's admired and loved solely for his character and skill. So that's the, that's the portrayal of the archetype. Point two is that the movie also contains the very best modern portrayal of the embittered villain, whose character and skill are simply insufficient, and he makes up for it through deceit and cruelness, while still knowing every step of the way that eventually he'll lose. There's nothing he can do about it. And three, the characters themselves are, are exquisite in their own right. But in this movie, they're juxtapositioned within a hostile brother framework, which makes it, uh, which is a deeply archetypal framework, which might be the reason that it, it sticks so much more than all the other archetypal figures. And this brings me to the central thesis. And I'm, I only figured this out two days ago, and I'm very excited to get to share this with you. I think the central implicit thesis throughout the whole movie is as follows. that no matter how powerful someone is, the pain of a man whose soul who has been irreversibly corrupted far exceeds the pain of a righteous man whose wife and son have been murdered and who's been reduced to abject slavery. Which is really something to, to think about. Hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, the, okay, so the themes that you've been developing there. Well, the, okay, so the first thing we might also note, though, that, that you... Um, lost over, maybe that's the right way of thinking about it, is that Maximus is a paragon of soldierly virtue, right? He's a mm -hmm. physical combatant, a warrior. Yeah. He's dutiful. Uh, he serves his commander, but also serves the principles, more importantly, yeah. serves the principles that govern his commander. And he yeah. serves the principles more than the commander himself. And you can tell that because he chooses not to serve the new emperor, Commodus. Yeah. Because he doesn't believe that he abides by the proper principles. And Commodus, of course, also killed his, his own father, which yeah. means that he killed the principles by which the state... Um, he's, like, he's like the elder gods in the Mesopotamian creation myth who kill Apsu, who's their father, and then try to live on his corpse. It doesn't work out well for them. All that does is breed chaos, and that's exactly what happens in, in, in the movie Gladiator as well. Yeah. Um, and that Maximus as son is an interesting, S-O-N, is also an interesting character because he becomes son as a consequence of his virtue rather than as a consequence yeah. of his birth, right? Commodus exactly. has, the, has the advantage of birth, but... Maximus has the advantage of virtue, but it's, it's virtue, it's a virtue of strength. And, um, you know, that makes the movie, in some sense, also extremely barbaric. There's just endless death and killing, which is a very strange thing when you're talking about someone who's operating within a fundamentally moral framework. And I guess part of the moral of the story is that it's better to be a soldier than a coward. And that's a 
you know, that's, it's not, I would say that on the one hand that's self-evident and on the other hand that's a mystery because the coward might be able to avoid the mayhem and killing that characterizes the life of the soldier. Anyways, Maximus does organize himself under the virtues of courage and, and forbearance and strength. Yeah, so, so my observation is actually, of course, he's, he's a very powerful soldier, but my observation is that that is not the reason, not so much the reason this archetype sticks. How I read this character, that he is the, the absolute embodiment of the characteristics that allow you to contend with tragedy and malevolence in an optimal way. Not just on the battlefield. It's not really about the battlefield. Right. Well, you see, you see his soldierly um, capability as a representation of competence itself. Yeah. Competence gu guided by principle. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. And yeah. I also think that that's probably how the conduct of a soldier should be judged, right? Yeah. yeah. It appears that soldiers are necessary despite the mayhem that warfare produces. Yeah. We haven't figured out how to dispense with that necessity. Yeah. So do you think oh, sorry, do you think the Canaan the do you think that the Canaan Able framework in which it is implicitly uh, structured, do you think that adds to to how much a story sticks? Yes, definitely. Like the, why, why is that? Well, because the, the story of Cain and Abel does lay out very, very elegantly and, and with incredible compression two fundamentally opposed modes of being. The mode of being that characterizes Abel, the favorite son, and the mode of being that characterizes Cain. And Abel is competent and virtuous and God-fearing, let's say, but more practically, which means he's allied with the highest of principles. That, that's the right way to think about it psychologically. Whatever the, that high, the highest of principles might be, there's an attempt. One of the things that you might consider psychologically is that the movement from polytheism to monotheism parallels, parallels the integration of the individual psyche and the development of larger and larger scale social organizations. All those things happen at the same time. So you imagine that the larger scale the organization, the human organization, so the more people included under the umbrella of the same state, the more organized and orderly the principles by which that state have to function must be because mm -hmm. of the increasing complexity and also the, the, the problem of having to determine how the state can remain intact over a long period of time without fragmenting. So the state has to organize itself so that the needs and wants of the bulk of the population are met with sufficient regularity so that the state itself doesn't fragment. And that means that the state has to organize itself in what you might regard as an, a virtuous manner that can be iterated. And at the same time, the people who compose the state in its increasing complexity have to ally themselves with that long-term state goal. So it's a, it's, a, it's a coalition between psychological integration and sociological complexity. And, and that's, that is foreshadowed, we might say, or accompanied by the movement from polytheism, which is the pulling of people in all directions by fundamental motivation or natural forces, into monotheism, which is the direction of the individual uh, under the rubric of a single set of principles, a single superordinate set of principles. Now, what those principles are is not obvious, which is partly why we're having the discussion of gladiator. So I, I can give you an example of this. So for example, um, in the Old Testament, you see the articulation of the guiding principles emerge in its most fully formed manner with the commandments of Moses. So you might say, all of the diverse forces that might pe pull people hither and yon have been aggregated into a list of thou shalt nots. Here's how to regulate yourself. Here's how to mm -hmm. inhibit yourself across time so that you can have a stable, long-term, large-scale society. 
But then there's a mystery that emerges in the New Testament, which is, it emerges, for example, when Christ is asked by the scribes and Pharisees, which is the greatest of the commandments? And Christ actually performs a very intelligent sleight of hand, and he says, well, you have to love God with all your heart and all your soul, and you have to love your brother as if he's yourself, love your neighbor as if he's yourself. On, on those two propositions rest all the commandments and the law. There's an attempt to integrate even the commandments into something that's a higher order principle, and that higher order principle actually manifests itself in, in Judeo-Christian society as the logos, whatever that is. And it's something like truthful communication devoted towards the highest good. And, and the embodiment of that becomes the fundamental principle. And, and in Gladiator, you see movement towards that embodiment, right? Because Maximus is an organized and disciplined person who's governed by principle. The question is, and the question is posed throughout the movie, well, what is Rome, right? That, that's asked for five yeah. times. It's asked by Marcus Aurelius because he feels that a lot of what he's done is a failure. It's asked by Commodus, and it's asked by the, the sister. Uh, whose whose name escapes me at the moment? Lucilla. Rome. Luc it's what? I think it's Lucilla. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and they all ask, "Well, what is Rome?" And she comes the closest. She says it's a great idea, but it, it's not. It's an animating principle. And the question is, what is the animating principle? Now, whatever it is, Maximus embodies it far more than Commodus, and Maximus is a able figure, e A-B-E-L, whereas yes. Commodus is, or Commodus is com clearly a figure of, of Cain. Yeah. He makes improper sacrifices and they're never well regarded. He says constantly, you know, that he all he ever did was try to please his father. Yeah. Well, his sacrifices went unappreciated and that's what made him bitter and resentful and murderous and and doomed to a, a catastrophic death and a figure of great evil and a tyrant and all of that. So yeah. yes, it's got a fundamentally archetypal structure. 